is Chantal Nabon. I am the current board chair, and I am so happy to welcome you on behalf of all of us who are board members and longtime members, charter members. We have many people to acknowledge and recognize today. But thank you to all of you who are guests and who are participating for the first time. We welcome you to our conference. Um, this is special and we're very excited because it's our first in-person conference in two years. So let's give ourselves a round of applause for being present. We have been a game. We have been a day here for a while now. Um, I've been a member for maybe 13, 14 years and for most of the conferences I've attended, we have had a wonderful partnership, relationship um, with Xavier University, so we are more than grateful to the university for having us, and we'll hear some representatives from them speak later. Um, also, I'd like to acknowledge our conference committee. Of course, with these kind of events, it takes a lot of behind-the-scenes action. You might have seen the running around as you were walking, and pardon me if I look flustered as well, but it takes so much dedication and um, and I love behind this. So I want to ask if you are a conference committee member for this year's conference, would you please stand or wave your hand and everybody hand clap for them. Thank you so much. I wanted to uh, acknowledge our six member board. We're a small team at the moment. I am board chair, but if you will, uh, Dr. Eva Baham, Simeon Baham is here. Stand, our board members are actually there, all over there. For now, Mark Rudine, Tara Martin Sutton, Mia James Blake. Why do I feel like and a special rec recognition to who I call Team Ellsworth. We have a family here that has been very dedicated, and if you say labor of love, it's the Ellsworth family. They're two men, their brothers, their sister-in-law, they're by marriage, but Cedric, Kenneth, Lynette, Sandra, and Jennifer Ellsworth, you may have spoken to them. Thumbs up. <coughs> all right. Thank you to Team Ellsworth for, for registration and all the behind the scenes. Um, we've been around since 2004, and eight, 18 years. We'll celebrate 20 soon. But it all started with a group of individuals who had a vision about what uh, what we should have here in place when it comes to providing an opportunity for people to educate themselves and give an opportunity to. Um, embark on family research, whether you're an amateur or professional at it. And the main thing is about celebrating our Creole history and culture. And Creole can go so many different directions, but we say Louisiana Creole. So I would like to acknowledge, and if you are here, any charter members, some of our first founding members. Thank you, that's Ms. Jeannie. Hi, Ms. Jeannie. Acknowledge um, from staff and Xavier. 
our um, from our president's office and his general staff. We have a previous presenter and participant of one of our conferences, Dr. Michelle Bell Boissier, who's going to come up, and she's going to uh, be followed by our conference chair, Dr. Elizabeth Rose. Thank you. Good morning. Um, your program says that uh, a representative from Xavier's president's office, Vice President uh, Patrice Bell, is the person who's supposed to be here this morning, but due to the board of directors meeting, she was not able to be here and she asked me to represent um, in her place. And I guess what I would like to say on behalf of myself and on behalf of Xavier, where I have been employed for almost 29 years now, this conference has been held annually at Xavier for several years now. Xavier is, officially, Xavier University of Louisiana. Part of the required curriculum for every student at this university is to take a course about the history of New Orleans. I think everyone in this room will agree that an understanding of what it means to be of Louisiana, an understanding of New Orleans culture, cannot occur without an understanding of Creole history and Creole heritage. For that reason, Xavier is proud and honored to have a partnership with the Creole Research Association, proud and honored to host this event with you, and we hope to continue this relationship for years to come. Thank you. in curating Louisiana's Creole heritage. Thank you, Michelle, for your welcome remarks. We have had a wonderful relationship with Sadie. Um, I have to mention that my dear partner for the last few years in the this conference could not be here today. And for those of you who were not at the meeting last night, our dear member, charter member, founder, Pat Shea Snyder, has is might still be in the hospital after having some um, some serious complications and could not be with us here today. But believe me, she is here in all of our spirits. So, so um, as a conference program chair, I'd like to welcome you. And we have, I need to give you just a little bit of history, so pardon those people who were at the annual meeting last night, which was absolutely wonderful. Let's give our board of directors a big hand. So put on. <laughs> we talk about the history that we have with the organization. We fondly call it NAMPAC, but it is the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which is part of the Smithsonian the big organization in Washington, D.C. Three years ago, this team came to New Orleans and they told us about this experience that they wanted to have and that they, what they were doing in terms of community curation. They came to Dillard and they came to Z. And they attracted all of the people who we now call our culture bearers to this university and to Dillard. And we had wonderful, glorious plans for collaboration and partnership. Four of us were at that meeting and we got super excited. We couldn't let it go. And we have maintained that friendship and that partnership through COVID, although you know, COVID silenced us all for a long time. So we were able to do that. And when uh, we came out of this fall that we've been in for three years, we had this opportunity to do something. It took several iterations, lots of partnership, lots of logistics, discussions, but we have come to this. And so we are very excited about welcoming. And they're pretty much all sitting at that last table back there in the room. So I'd like for you to give them all they can, please. Well, they, I think 
think they're going to Grambling, and I think they're going to Southern too. So all of the historical black universities in this state are um, going to be included in this community curation digitization project. But the person, the expert to really speak on this is going to be coming up to the mic, Dr. Doretha Williams. And Dr. Doretha Williams is the director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, Smith Center. Dr. Williams' bio is on the last page of the program. Feel free to refer to it to read all of the accolades for Dr. Williams. But she's going to talk to you so you can listen to her too. Good morning, everyone. We were so thrilled to be here back in 2020 and to meet um, with the organizations that really represent the history here in New Orleans. And um, we went back and forth, we were here today, we were you know, over there at Dillard. And then, of course, the pandemic hit. And all I could think of, and all that our team could think of, was keeping the promise to get back here. And so we're glad it took us a minute. Uh, the pandemic really shut everything down. And so we're glad to be here in a very safe way, in a very productive way. Uh, again, my name is Judy Williams. I do serve as the director of the Robert F. Smith Center uh, at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And we're so grateful to be back here in New Orleans. I want to take the opportunity to introduce the other members of our staff who will be presenting uh, and, and taking you all through a couple of hands-on um, projects as well. Dr. Angela Wyman, who's standing to raise your hand. She is here with us. She is our program. <laughs> she is a homegirl. She's born and raised in uh, the Staten City of New Orleans. Um, and she joined us back in 2018. Uh, before that, she served at, as at the Mitchell Center for African American Heritage and Diversity Programming at Delaware, Delaware Historical Society. So she will be with us and talking more about the digital projects that we do. We have Lisa Crawley, who will be coming to you a little bit uh, later this morning. Lisa Crawley, you raise your hand. Lisa is our uh, genealogy reference assistant. She is one of two staff members who manage the Family History Center, which is an on-site and virtual space for the work she does with our visitors. Uh, she takes people through genealogy sessions, puts together programming uh, in the field of, of genealogy, and also manages a lot of our programs on the road. So she will be coming to you uh, around 10 15 to talk about breaking uh, the Brick Wall and Public Genealogy. Leah Jones. Leah Jones is the, there she is, who are the the greatest photographer I've ever, ever met. Um, she is also our still image uh, manager when we're on the road for community curation. If you've ever had your picture taken by Leah Jones, uh, it's a masterpiece. Trust and believe. She's very uh, fabulous at her job, and she will be speaking with you later this morning as well. CK Ning, stand up. CK is our work on media conservation and digitization specialist. CK manages our what we call moving images, and that's moving video sound uh, to digitize that work. She also manages, excuse me, manages the media lab. Uh, also a space in the museum where attendees can bring their actual items and have them digitized. Awesome, you will be learning a little bit more from her later this afternoon. Ina Archer, Ina Archer is our second media conservation specialist. Uh, Ina also works in the, what we call the Great Home Movie, uh, the Great Migration Movie Project. Uh, and in the media lab, so we are glad that they are both with us here on this trip to talk about moving images. Did I get everyone? Camila Sennett? Wade? Camila Sennett? Now, sir, then, if you, any of you have been on the National Museum's website and, and followed that, um, Camila it manages the Searchable Museum. 
if you ever go online and see that. So Camila is behind all of that fabulousness that we have online now. She, of course, was here with us in 2020 because she was on our team. And um, we just brought her with us because <laughs> we always uh, have a great relationship as a team. And uh, we know we are back on the road with us. So that is the team we have with us. Uh, we have several more colleagues who have been in and out and will be with us uh, later in the month and have already been with us already at Dillard. Thank you so very much. You'll hear from me again later, so I will um, not take up too much time. We are so grateful to be here and excited to work with you all uh, and specifically working with the, the law for you all. Thank you so very much. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here, and uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm delighted to be in New Orleans uh, when you're working on the topic of free people of color. A lot of people think about New Orleans, and so it's great to be able to speak about my work in this specific place. So what I want to do today is talk a little bit about my research on free people of color in the South. And so that is going to include Louisiana, but other parts of the, the nation as well, going up all the way to areas such as Kentucky and Maryland, Delaware. And so first what I want to do is to just read a little bit from my book, um, and then I'll talk through more about what, I, what I'm doing and um, what we'll be talking about. So, beginning of my book, I talk about a man named Amariah Reed, and I write that Amariah Reed lived out a life that was typical of many men of the generation in the South. Born a subject of the British Crown around 1762 in Nashville County, Virginia, by age 16, Reed had enlisted in the effort to overthrow British power in Virginia and several other colonies. After participating in various skirmishes against British forces, Reed was present for the surrender of Lord Cornwallis at Yorktown. Following the war, Reed returned to Nashville County, settling down on an 80-acre tract with his growing family by the early 1800s. Reed's 80 acres eventually became the inheritance of his children, 
who would continue to prosper from the foundations laid by the Father. Yet Amariah Reed also stood apart as a man who was born free in a time when most other people of color in the future U.S. South were born enslaved. Unlike the majority of people turned quote unquote colored in his community, Reed could and did hold title to personal and real property. He could work for himself, provide for his family, and keep his wages without interference from a white master. In the courts of Virginia, he could sue and be sued. As a free person of color, however, he was also subjected to a number of restrictions and forms of legal discrimination. Since the time of his birth, Virginia law prevented him from enjoying some of the civil rights possessed by his white male neighbors. And that would include the right to vote, and the ability to hold public office. When Reed decided to spend the rest of his life with Betsy Skeeter, Virginia law prohibited him from marrying because he was quote unquote colored and she was quote unquote white. By the time of his death, the state had passed laws that prohibited Reed from traveling freely between Virginia and other localities, required him to obtain a license in order to own a gun, and demanded that he register with county officials in order to receive documents proving his free status. Reed was wedged in the curious position of being both free and yet a person of color. So I decided to introduce Amariah Reed's story for a couple of reasons. Uh, for one, it tells you a little bit about what inspired me to write about the topic of free people of color and also, this story is a brief synopsis of the larger points that I've tried to make in my book. And so as far as the inspiration for this work, I'm a descendant of Amariah Reed. And so my interest in my family and led me to become interested in the topic of free people of color as a kid. And I took my interest as a kid all the way to becoming a professor of history. And now the second part of Reed's story that is important for today's presentation is that Reed's story shows the back and forth situation for many free people of color when it came to opportunity attached to being free, but also the struggles that many free people of color had to face in the South. And these are the struggles that you see all the way from the Deep South to the Upper South across time. And so now I wanted to show you a few of the records that I used to tell MRI Reed's story. Um, this is the pension application, part of the pension application for Reed. And in this pension application, he talks about his service during the war, uh, including the story about Yorktown that I mentioned. This is a uh, tax list where I was able to locate Reed. And there's a column you see with numbers. And so that column represents the amount of acres that each of the people on the list owned. And so that's how I was able to figure out he had 80 acres. Uh, unlike New Orleans, uh, the records where MRI Reed was from are not in very good shape. And so it took a tax list like this for me to even get a, a basic understanding of what he was able to accomplish in his life and the needs of this county existing. And then this is the federal census record, which is a little bit awkward uh, in the sense that it, it mentions him and Mariah of Reed, which was a common usage in this particular county. And then it says specifically that he has a white wife. Um, in the 1830 census, there's a few other free people of color who show up with the same uh, notation. But it's just very interesting to see that uh, the census taker was willing to admit that there was such a relationship taking place, not only with check marks, but this specific notation of white, white. So it says something about the way that the community interpreted their relationship, although they were not being married. 
Now, for the rest of the presentation, I wanted to just give you some brief, brief background information on the demographics of free people of color, and then talk a little bit more about the different parts of my research specifically. Before I do that, these are my two other books. So uh, you can see that I'm trying to start from the local level with Herford County, North Carolina's free people of color and their descendants, which is a uh, study of a small county in North Carolina. Uh, and this particular history goes from the colonial period into the 20th century. And then after that, I published North Carolina's Free People of Color, which is a more general history of North Carolina. Now here's the population data that I was talking about. Uh, for the numbers that I'm going to talk to discuss today, uh, they speak primarily about the 1860 census, the right before the Civil War. But you can see in this chart uh, the different parts of the South and the, we'll say, approximate number of free people of color in each of these states. So I think some people, when they see this chart, they're kind of surprised to see where it places with the largest number of free people of color actually. And you can see they are in the upper south, so places like Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, Delaware, and then you see Louisiana comes after Delaware in 1860 when it comes to population of free people of color. Um, other deep south areas tend to be towards the bottom of just a few hundred uh, free people of color. Arkansas in 1860, you see there's only 144 people. And that's because Arkansas had passed a law right before the 1860 census um, that was to require free people of color to either leave the state or be enslaved. And so a lot of people actually left Arkansas right before the census. And that's why you have such a small number of free people there. This is a more visual view of that, so you can get a sense of the proportions of free people of color in different parts of the region. So bright green color represents Maryland. That kind of tealish color is Virginia. The light blue is North Carolina. Delaware is the purple. And Louisiana is the bright pink color. So you can see that those four upper south states make up a huge portion of the free people of color overall in the south. And just to add a little more context, nationally, um, Maryland and Virginia are still number one and number two in the whole entire nation. So even if you look at places like Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, which also had relatively large populations of free people of color, uh, those states are far ahead of the others. Now I also wanted to offer you another breakdown of the population looking at uh, counties, cities, uh, <coughs> to see how their, their free people of color are distributed in those particular areas. And so you can see Baltimore County, which would include modern day Baltimore County as well as the city of Baltimore, um, is at the top of the list, followed by Orleans Parish, which of course is where we are today. And then uh, Washington, D.C. Now, Washington, D.C. is a little bit tricky. If you include Washington and Georgetown, which were actually separate districts uh, during 1860, then Washington, D.C. would be above Orleans Parish slightly when it comes to populations of free people of color. But you can see from the list, the list for the most part uh, reflects what you saw as far as the distribution being heavily in the upper south. And you probably notice that there are many places on this list that you've never heard of. Uh, some of them, that's because they're just very rural places. Others are, uh, there are cities that you've probably heard of, like Anne Arundel County is Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, Kent County, Delaware is Dover. Uh, Newcastle is Wilmington. Uh, Dinwiddie County, Virginia would also include Petersburg, Virginia for anybody who's in so now that I've given you these figures, I want to go ahead and get into the um, meat of the book and the things that I've discussed. 
So my book is constructed of seven different chapters, and it's basically chronological, going from the colonial period through the Civil War. Now, some of you who do research know that the colonial period is different areas varies a little bit. The colonial period of Louisiana is not the same as the colonial period of Virginia. But uh, the beginning of my book basically ranges from, say, the 1600s going to about the 1760s, looking at that period. And so in that particular section of my book, I'm looking at a couple of things. First, I'm trying to identify the origins of free people of color, where this population pop up from. And then I'm also trying to get a sense of what were their lives like in the colonial period in different parts of the South. And so as far as their origins, uh, you've got some free people of color who were born free in parts of the South. You've got other free people of color who are free from the process of a mission in which an enslaved person becomes a free person. Now, being free and being born free can happen in a lot of different ways. Uh, generally speaking, if your mother's free in most parts of the South, you're free. Uh, in the Upper South, you see a lot of free people of color who come about as a result of their mother being either Native American or white. Uh, you see less of that the further south you go. And Native Mission seems to play more of a role in the colonial period. Part of that is in parts of the Upper South, uh, the ability to become free through Native Mission is restricted pretty early on and there are laws prohibiting that. Or you have to go through some long petition process. So as a result, the number of free people of color in the upper south regions who are born, who are many native people, is relatively low. But that would change later on. And then, as far as looking at the lives of free people of color specifically, I tried to break down the uh, population based on class and the different class experiences. Because you have some free people of color, such as Isaac Cromwell, who is mentioned in the advertisement that you can see uh, on the screen. Isaac Cromwell was a servant. It seems that he had been moved around different parts of uh, the colonies, the British colonies specifically. Uh, this particular ad is about Isaac in Maryland, Frederick County, Maryland. But I found some information about him after writing my book where he was actually in New York before this. But anyways, in this article you can see that Isaac had run away with his wife, who was an English woman, and so their master is trying to have them return. Now you can imagine why Isaac might have ran away. Clearly, being a servant, his liberties are limited. Uh, he doesn't have the ability to uh, do what he wants to do in life. And he's 45 years old, just imagine that. And so I talk about Isaac and I talk about many other free people of color who are trapped in servitude often for generations and the limits that that has on their lives. And those limits can vary quite a bit. But I see that the, the limits of servitude are particularly harsh on women during this time period um, because women often are punished if they have children while they are in servitude and that causes this multi-generational effect where the mother is in servitude and, you, and often in the upper south you get trapped in servitude until you're at least 31 years old. So you got to think about this. That you're, you're supposed to not marry and not have children until you're 31 in the colonial period. That's pretty difficult for a lot of people. And so as a result, you'll have mothers who have extended periods of servitude from having children, and then their children also get thrown into servitude as well for another 31 years. And so that's how you get the cycle of generation after generation. And as a result, 
you, you have a situation where, yes, maybe three people of color, especially in the upper south, are connected to white people, but they're poor because they are stuck in this process of servitude that goes on and on for generations. And in other cases, you may have many different people who are also related to white people, but they may not have to deal with some of these same issues that uh, people who are descended from white women serve as them. Now, on the other side of the uh, situation for free people of color, we're thinking about their economic standing is those free people of color who were relatively successful in the colonial period. And so one of those successful free people of color that I discussed in my book is William Chavis. And William Chavis was located in North Carolina, Granville County, North Carolina specifically. And Granville County is a place that probably a lot of people have never heard of, but it had a relatively significant number of free people of color from the colonial period all the way through the Civil War. And so what's important about Chavis is uh, there are a couple of things. For one, in the colonial period, he's literate, which is relatively rare. Um, two, he's a property holder. It seems that at one point he may have owned up, up to a thousand acres of land. Uh, he also was involved in a variety of different businesses at the time, which was very unusual for a free person of color, especially in this region. And uh, in addition to that, he himself was a master. So he was he enslaved other people and made some of his wealth through that process. So you can see how his life would have been much different than that of somebody like Isaac Cromwell, who was stuck in servitude. And because of the success that he had, his family was able to benefit from that in later generations. Now following my discussion of the colonial period, I move on to the Revolutionary Era. And I roughly define that as the 1760s into the end of the 1700s. And so I'm including not just the American Revolution, but uh, activities that take place right before that are very much connected to that, and then some of the aftermath of the revolution. And so in this particular period, I think the most important thing to understand is that you have an expansion of freedom across the region, both in areas that are once, were once controlled or are controlled, depending on the time period, by the English, but also in other areas, including those controlled by the Spanish. And so we see uh, the growth of free people of color here in this area, but also in uh, places like Virginia and Maryland. And so that growth is brought about for a variety of different reason, reasons. In this area, uh, the change from the French control of the area to the Spanish control of the area creates opportunities for enslaved people that were not uh, earlier available. It's easier to become free under Spanish law. And so that is part of why we see an expansion of uh, free people of color in this region. And then when we're thinking about further north in the southern parts of the United States, um, there are a couple of things going on. Some people are being inspired by the ideas of the revolution itself and the ideas about freedom, and they cite these ideas when they decide to manage people. You also have uh, religious movements that are taking place in the Upper South. Uh, the most famous, of course, is amongst the Quakers. And these movements for freedom amongst these groups also create opportunities for enslaved people to obtain freedom themselves. So some of the restrictions that existed in the colonial period that I mentioned earlier uh, are rescinded or there are limits placed on those restrictions, and so that allows for this explosion in the number of free people of color uh, across the region. 
And so that's why you end up in places like Maryland, Virginia, in particular, places that are close to the north, uh, where you see large populations of free people of color compared to the rest of not just the South, but the United States as a whole. In addition to this expansion and ammunition that I discussed, I talked about a few other ways that, that uh, people obtain their freedom or are able to at least secure freedom. And one of those important ways is through freedom suits. Uh, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with freedom suits, but these are actions in which individuals claim that they're being illegally enslaved and they will go to court and file a complaint and obtain their freedom and usually they have somebody speak on their behalf who will talk about their histories, their uh, the family history, sometimes going back several generations in order to prove that they are actually free and not enslaved. And so one of those people that I uh, mentioned in my work is a woman named Phyllis. And so Phyllis was being illegally enslaved in Delaware in the late 1700s. And Phyllis claims her freedom through her grandmother, who she, as well as another witness, say came from India. The East Indies, and that's why I have this illustration. Um, that's one of the more rare cases, but you also see people who claim that they have a white uh, mother or grandmother, great-grandmother. You see people who make claims uh, through Native American ancestry, and that also happens both in the Upper South as well as in the Lower South. You see that in Louisiana occasionally. And so this is an important, an important excuse me, important uh, movement that's taking place alongside the growth of the Manning Mission. And many of the individuals that are involved in the Manning Mission movement are also involved in helping people who claim to be illegally enslaved with their freedom. In addition to talking about this growth, I, I do mention a little bit about what free people of color are doing in the revolutionary period. Of course, some of them are fighting in the revolution on various sides of that revolution. There are people who support the British, there are people who are fighting for the Spanish, and there are people who are fighting for the United States. But also I talked about some of the activism that's taking place in the late 1700s, and so one of the key people that I focus on is Benjamin Banneker, of whom I'm sure some of you have heard about before. Banneker was from Maryland and published an almanac but in addition to this almanac, he was a voice for the rights of people of color in the late 1700s and made uh, important statements about what he saw as the contradictions between what the founding fathers claimed they were doing and uh, what they were actually doing in practice, which was enslaving other people. And so uh, I think he's really important for that reason. And there are other interesting people that I focus on in that time period, but I will not be able to talk about them today. Um, now, with the expansion and growth of the population of free people of color across many parts of the South, you see by the early 1800s, and in some places even before that, a backlash towards this growth. And so the backlash looks different in different places. Some places are restricting the movements of free people of color. Some places are re-implementing the restrictions on manumission or implementing something that might look a little bit different from the colonial period restrictions, but are still meant to curb the growth in the populations of free people of color. You also see the um, establishment of colonization societies in different parts of the country, including the National Colonization Society. And so the images that you see are related to that story of the colonization of specifically Liberia. And so Joseph Jenkins Roberts and Jane Warren Roberts were originally from Virginia and moved to Liberia earlier in their adulthood. Now uh, Roberts, Joseph Jenkins Roberts, had moved there to establish a business. He wanted to basically bring goods from the United States into Liberia. Eventually, when Liberia gains independence, he'll become the first president of Liberia. 
But um, I just say that to just to mention that although the colonization society was partially at least meant to remove free people of color from the United States, uh, that was the mission of many, at least from the viewpoint of many of the people who were involved in the, the uh, creation of the American colonization society. There were some free people of color who saw the establishment of Liberia as an opportunity and uh, Roberts was one of those people. Now, after focusing on the backlash that takes place in the early 1800s, say roughly 1800 and 1830, I go back and try to look at what free people of color were able to do despite that backlash. And so that's, you can see there's a pattern in, in my work of trying to show not only uh, the challenges that free people of color face, but also what they were able to do despite those challenges. And so I discuss a variety of different things from the growth of families to uh, the creation of institutions. And some of the more important institutions that are developed in this time period are churches for people of color specifically. Um, especially in the Upper South, you see a uh, growing divide within uh, different denominations about the roles of people of color within those denominations. And because of discrimination, the inability to have a real say in certain uh, churches, many free people of color decide to create their own institutions. And so one of the key institutions that was developed in Baltimore, Maryland is Bethel Church, which still exists today. And this is an image of the inside of the church in the mid-1800s. In addition to creating churches, free people of color across the region are establishing schools for their children. And Daniel Coker is one of the key individuals helping to educate children in Baltimore. And many of the schools that are established have connections with religious institutions, uh, whether you're in this region or in the upper south. And then I also focus on the creation of businesses uh, where free people of color are doing everything from the most basic hard labor <coughs> to creating shops like the one owned by Louis Corny, Louis Corny, who was uh, here in New Orleans. And you can sell, see that he was selling clothing and fine fabrics. I talk about other people who established barber shops, restaurants. Um, so free people of color, despite this backlash that's taking place in the early 1800s, are still able to do quite a bit. Now, following my pattern, I have to go back to what's not going so well in the South. And so I look at what happens from about the period of 1830 to 1860 in different parts of the region. And one of the key events that affects free people of color in various parts of the South is the uh, 1831 Matt Turner Rebellion. And so the Matt Turner Rebellion doesn't, the actual rebellion itself, isn't the, the most important part of the story. It's what happens uh, after the rebellion takes place. So following the rebellion, in many parts of the South, especially those that are closest to where the rebellion took place, which was in the southern part of Virginia, Southampton County, Virginia, we see um, some of these harsh laws that I talked about that were passed in the early 1800s being enforced for the first time. Because many laws are passed, but they're not always enforced against free people of color. This is the moment where you do see some enforcement. Um, so you see confiscation of weapons, that free people of color had, uh, free people of color who don't have freedom papers or arrested in the jail. And so some of the 
the, the, some of the way I, part of the way I was able to put together the story was through the account of Willis Augustus Hodges. So Hodges, later in his life, published a series of articles, and in those series of articles, he discusses what he remembers about the Turner Rebellion. He lived, I'm going to say, maybe about 100 miles away, but even 100 miles away, his life and that of his family and friends were affected by um, the uproar that took place on the ground following the rebellion in the days after the rebellion took place. Now, in addition to free people of color uh, dealing with this harsh enforcement, you will also see uh, the passage of laws uh, adding additional restrictions to the lives of free people of color. Now, the way that I interpret this is that many of the laws that were passed were ideas that had been around for a while. And in certain places, they're not new at all. But it's the rebellion that gives politicians a particular opportunity to implement these restrictions. So every hateful person who has an agenda out against free people of color is petitioning to have restrictions placed on free people of color, uh, wants to get rid of free people of color if possible. So the colonization society is like, we need more money uh, for uh, the removal of free people of color. Now, interestingly, they get some of what they want, but they don't get everything they want, especially the colonization society. The colonization society, their goal in many cases is to remove free people of color, yet nobody wants to actually pay for the removal of free people of color. So you have all this rhetoric out here about how terrible <coughs> people of color are, and they're taking people's jobs, and all this kind of stuff. But it's one thing to talk about that, and it's another thing to actually do something about it, and they don't really want to do anything serious. Now, this same section, I, I go beyond just the Nat Turner Rebellion and its immediate aftermath, and I focus on uh, other legal obstacles that are put in place throughout the um, 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, including that law that I mentioned earlier in the presentation where free people of color are supposed to be removed from Arkansas. So there was a whole movement across the region where lawmakers were trying to implement these enslavement and removal laws. So basically you were threatened with enslavement if you did not leave. A lot of people clearly uh, were frightened by the prospect of this and actually did leave the South. Uh, you have people who, in certain parts of the country, are going to Mexico, they're going to the Caribbean. Uh, those people who are further north are going to Ohio, they're going to New York, Pennsylvania, Canada, trying to uh, get away because they don't know what's going to happen. Maybe these laws will pass, maybe they won't. Ultimately, they fail in almost every, in almost every part of the South except for Arkansas. Because, again, who's going to pay for this removal? How are you going to enforce this removal? Um, in certain communities, free people of color are so important to remove them would be problematic. And so that that is part of why uh, ultimately that doesn't happen. In addition to legal issues that free people of color are facing, uh, I discuss some of the problems that free people of color who are trying to push against the system of the time face. And one of those free people of color who's pushing against the system is Leonard Grimes. Leonard Grimes is originally from Virginia and is based in Washington, D.C. in the period after the Nat Turner Rebellion, 1830s. And he participates in helping enslaved people go to the North. And during one of his uh, engagements to try to help enslaved people, he's caught. He ends up being placed in jail. He goes to state penitentiary for several years. Uh, once he leaves the state penitentiary, he goes north and continues his anti-slavery work from there. And he's just one of many individuals who are doing this type of uh, important work in the mid-1800s. Now, of course, going back to my pattern, following the story of the harsh 
uh, reality that many free people of color have to face and the attempts to make life, the lives of free people of color more difficult. I try to focus on what free people of color were able to do even in this late period. Because many historians who have looked at the 1840s, the 1850s, 1860s say that um, the experiences of free people of color were particularly harsh in that time. But I recognize that yes, indeed, there are um, attempts to make their lives very difficult, but despite that, they are able to persevere. They're able to, again, continue the creation of their businesses. They're able to continue to create different organizations, whether those are fraternal organizations, uh, organizations to support the education of their children. Um, the, the laws that we see on the book are not necessarily a reflection of the day to day lives of free people of color. That, that's the part of what I want to get at. And so, in doing that, I talk about a variety of different individuals, and I just want to mention a few of them that I cover. One is Daniel Payne. Daniel Payne was involved in the AME Church um, and was a bishop in the AME Church at one point. He was a teacher as well as a minister, and in his early life, he was growing up in Charleston, South Carolina. When things in Charleston got a little bit rough, he decided to go further north. He did a lot of work in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, teaching, helping with the churches there. Um, he's also involved in like, more important local business, such as like burial societies that people come up with. Um, in my section about businesses, I talk about a variety of different individuals. One of the, the key individuals that I focus on is Washington Spradling. And Washington Spradling uh, was from Louisville, Kentucky, and was a barber. He was very successful in his barbering business. And he used the money that he obtained in his barbering business not only to buy land and things that you would expect somebody who's pretty well to do, to use their money for, but he loans money to the slave people for the to buy themselves. And he says he got paid back in some cases, but in other cases he, he never made that money. Now, um, Washington Spradling is buried in a cemetery in Louisville, Kentucky, and you can see the stone here, or at least part of the stone. It's quite impressive. I mean, I think it goes up to we go up to the ceiling of this room that we're in. Um, the monument is there. It's probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest, monument in that cemetery. And from what I can tell, it's a cemetery that is mixed with uh, people of color and white people as well. So he, um, at least in death, was trying to uh, show how significant he was in life. Another interesting person that I mentioned, and I, I mentioned that this within. Um, around the issue of education is John Patterson Sampson. He was from North Carolina. His father was a pretty well to do successful businessman in North Carolina, Wilmington, North Carolina area. Um, and he's one of a small number of free people of color who were able to leave the South and go to college. Of course, opportunities for higher education were limited or completely restricted in the South. And so free people of color had to either go north or they had to go outside of the country in order to obtain college education. And so he actually went to Boston and obtained his education there. Now to end my book, I focus on a really important moment in the history of the country and that's the Civil War. And the Civil War is an important story of free people of color, not only because it affected their lives and they participated in the war, but it is a moment that will ultimately bring about change in their status in the society. Because this category of being a free person of color after the war doesn't have the same legal meaning that it would have before the war. Now, in talking about the Civil War, I focus on what people of free people of color are able to do uh, under the Confederate government and what life was like for them 
but also what happens when the U.S. government is able to come into certain parts of the South and reclaim those areas. And you see a variety of different things. Some people are just trying to live, to live their lives the way that they lived before the war, as much as possible. They're going to their churches, um, they're continuing with their businesses. Some free people of color see the war as an opportunity, and they get involved in uh, doing business with the federal government, but that's those are the people who got the money. Uh, you have other people who are very resistant to what the uh, Confederacy is trying to do, and they're, you know, they go into hiding when, it, when somebody tries to impress them. Uh, there are some people who actually send their children outside of the, the uh, South in order to prevent their children from having to be impressed into the Confederate service, digging trenches or whatever other types of work that the uh, Confederate government might want them to do. The later part of my story, like I said, is to is that I focused on the ways that free people of color participated in the effort to preserve the United States. And so they do that through a variety of different ways. Uh, one way that I think many of us think about is that they are they serve as soldiers in the army. And so you have uh, early units of free people of color from this area who participate in that effort. You also have free people of color in places like North Carolina, Virginia, uh, that have come under the U.S. government that are able to participate early on. And then you've got, of course, a few free people of color, or well, not a few, actually, a significant number of free people of color, who are living in the upper south states that remain in the Union. And, um, places like Maryland. One of those individuals was Moses Hammond, who you see in this picture. Moses served in the army and then later worked in the commissary, so he was helping to take care of sick people. Um, and this little image was preserved in his Civil War pension file, which is where I found a lot of the information about free people of color during this time. The pension files were great, not only for uh, learning about what happened in battles, but also some of the social history of free people of color during that time. And sometimes people will mention things that happened before. So uh, I don't know how many of you may have ancestors who were, uh, who participated in the war, but those are, those are great sources. Um, in addition to fighting in the war, we have free people of color doing a lot of other supportive activities. Uh, you have some free people of color who are working as scouts, for the U.S. Army, you have free people of color who are informants because as the Army is going through the South, they have to figure out who can they trust in order to get information about the area of free people of color play a key role. And then you have other free people of color who are participating in helping the uh, recently freed people. One of those people is Mary Smith Peake, and she ran a uh, school for free people of color. Uh, near Fort Monroe in Virginia. There are other free people of color who, uh, in addition to working in schools, were trying to support soldiers, so they created um, aid societies for the soldiers to take care of the soldiers when they're sick, to provide them the things that they work in from the Army. Um, you also see organizations that are created to raise money on behalf of the free people who, you can imagine, they have run away from um, plantations and they need just the most basic necessities in order to stay alive. And so the free people of color were helping to organize that. And then I end my book uh, discussing the Reconstruction period and what happens to free people of color afterwards. There's a lot more work that needs to be done on that particular topic within the context of free people of color. Um, but here are a couple of familiar individuals that I mentioned in that section um, about the Reconstruction Movement and free people of color. And I try to connect some of the injustices that free people of color experienced in the 1800s and before with some of the injustices that we see 
today in our society and how in many ways the experiences of free people of color can tell us quite a bit about the world that we live in now. So I'm going to stop there and I appreciate your attention. If you're interested in my book and learning more about the story of free people of color in the South, there's some information for you. And that code is good for the press website. You can read more about the book itself and uh, purchase there wherever you want to if you're interested. So thank you again for your attention. My name is Lisa Call, and I just want to thank you for having this event today. It's wonderful to be back in the city of New Orleans. It's my first time back in about 40 years, and um, it made such an impression upon me back in the 80s when I was here that I came back in my car. So it's just a wonderful place to be again. So this morning, just for a short period of time, I'm going to be talking about breaking the 1870 brick wall in public genealogy. Now, I know many of you have, you know, you guys have been looking at records from 1800, 1700s, which is way far back. So this yeah. is just like genealogy 101. Um, and hopefully you may learn something in order, in terms of um, getting others started into your family tree. Because that's what you do as a new thing. So I'll be going through those steps today. So when visitors walk into the Family History Center at the museum, we get them started tracing their family tree. And we couldn't do this without our team. And so in the Family History Center, we have um, our co-workers, Hannah Scrubs. She's a genealogy representative. She is featured there to my left as I'm looking at it. And to your left. Uh, she will be here later this week. And in Melissa Nett, as she was introduced earlier today, who is now the museum sort of the museum too. And so it takes a bunch of us to get both started and trace the European tree. And over the last five years, we have worked with people from around the country and even across the world. One factor that remains constant is a deep-seated interest in learning about one's roots. Many of our visitors re are researching with a sense of discovery. They don't know what they might find or how far they might actually go in this process. So I'm going to talk about where we actually begin. So we start by sharing best practices in genealogy. What do I mean by that? We explain how to use free genealogy databases, such, such as Ancestry Library Edition, family search, and sometimes all three. We highlight the U.S. federal census collection, and then we talk about other public records as they might find in your search. And then we conclude by identifying the first major goal in African American genealogy. And we call that getting back to 1870, right? The first census after slavery, where all African Americans are free. In the time that we have the folks that walk into the Family History Center, most people generally fall into about three categories. Um, everybody pretty much usually finds records somewhere between 1900 and 1950. And as they find records, they take a screenshot or take a picture of their own. A second group finds records between 1870 and 1880, and then we start showing them having these slaves together. A lot of people will get stuck at 1870, obviously, um, and they don't know how to use slave schedules. If they're from free uh, families of color, we continue to find people, obviously. But one of our main teaching goals is showing people how to use the slave schedule, and I'll be showing that in a couple of minutes. And then a third group, a very small group, they're able to find enslaved ancestors during slavery. And this is the third group that I'll be talking about. <coughs> and so in terms of brick wall case studies from this third group, I hope to create regional models in African American genealogy that will assist <coughs> others in breaking their 1870 brick wall. So today, we're going to follow the journey of a family with Tennessee roots. So when Alton Glass of California 
and his grandmother, Hattie May, joined me on the Zoom. We started with Ms. Hattie, and I'll be showing that record in a minute. She was from Tiptonville, Lake County, Tennessee. Uh, and as, as we started to find hits, I talk about analyzing every record really carefully, start tracking your family by generation, and pay attention to what makes up an actual household and who is living with whom at any given time. So on this slide, Hattie Mae is there in yellow. She's three years old. The family's in Lake County. Her parents are John W. Glass and Annie Mae. And in 1940, she has one brother, Charles. We also impress, impress upon guests to scan the whole census, right? Because when you open an original record, you're not just seeing your family, you're seeing an entire neighborhood. So we tell people to be nosy. Look at the whole family. You'll find, you may find parents next door, grandparents, future spouses, in-laws, and others living nearby, or perhaps even next door. This is Hattie Mae Glass's digital record, and we encourage people to make copies of both the digital record, which you can easily see, and the original record as well. One thing, though, about the digital records, which is not the case in this um, particular record, you may see a lot of spelling errors. Sometimes when you're dealing with the public, when you don't see things spelled right, you're wondering if it's the actual record for their family, and then you open the original record. So we always tell them, Patience. Now, in this case, when we're working with the public, and we see Hattie Mae is three, her brother Charles is five, the next step, she has to make a choice who you want to follow, right? Your mother or your father. They have to pick someone, and in this case, they pick the father, John W. Glass, who's pictured here as age 38. I often tell people you may want to start with the person who you know the most about, because if you do that, You'll likely find your family, you'll find more records, and you'll learn the process faster. And then you can apply what you've learned to other branches of the family that may be harder to find. So you get a lot of people into the family history center, and you know, they had some uncle that no one has seen since the 60s or 70s. And then I tell them, you know, in 30 minutes, you probably won't find that person either. So you may want to pick someone who you know the most about. So that's generally what we do. <coughs> so with John Glass, we wanted to find him with his birth family. With his birth family. And this is the lady record fit the bill. We discovered John Glass was born Wallace Glass in 1906 in Lauderdale County, Tennessee. His parents were Wallace Glass of Hayward County, and his mother was Jenny Beard of Lauderdale County. In Tennessee, the late birth records were created for people before the year 1914. So that's how that record happened to be created. So now is a good time to go mapping. And a lot of times we're working with young adults, and they have not necessarily visited the places where their grandparents and their great-grandparents came from. So as we start finding records, you know, I encourage them Start pulling out your maps and finding out where these people came from. Do it on your phone. I like to use county maps or whatever works for you. So with the Glass family, we've already identified three counties. Hattie was from Lake County, and as you can see, that's Northwest Tennessee. John Glass was born in Lauderdale, and then his father, Wallace, the second generation of Wallaces, was born in Haywood County but all three counties are part of Western <coughs> Tennessee. And again, for this county, Lake and Lauderdale are border counties. So you want to keep in mind when you're researching border counties, you always want to look at the state next door as well. In this 1910 census record for Lauderdale County, now we have the entire family. And we see our Wallace, who we started with John Wallace. He is the five-year-old. He's third from the bottom. 
There are seven children in the family, and there's even a little child who's listed here as zero, but it's actually two months old on the original record. And the census here identified him as fat right. Also, we found that their marriage record is split up. And again, another confirmation, they got married in 1896 in Lauderdale County, while his class and Jane E. So where else might we find records? We all always help you do the old history and start at home first. I'm going to divert for just a second. Um, we encourage people, I ask them, do you have any family Bibles in your family? And so this is the Ellis Family Bible. It's from the permanent collection of the museum. One of those late 19th century Bibles that when you open them, they list the birth, marriages, and deaths of the family. So that's another great source of being Bible records as well. So we encourage people to look for those records. And if you can't find those Bible records in your family on the commercial databases, on FamilySearch, on Ancestry, check out the CDC website. You tell folks, right, because not all these Bible records are online. You may have to pay for them. What's great about the CDC website, it outlines how it came by the records for all states and U.S. territories. Many of the CDC pages also identify when the state began keeping those Bible records for each area, either birth, marriage, death, or divorce. And then for older Bible records, we tell folks, you may have to contact the state archives as you do in the state of Maryland or the state library. Sometimes the state is so often society, but be ready to spend some bucks in order to find that information. And if you get stuck, try a filter search. Select the census where your family's records stop, and then input their last name and place of residence and see if you can pick them up again. And in this particular case, just as an example with the Glass family, we selected the 1870 census, we entered the last city, the last Lauderdale County, and when we did this, this was the return that came up. A whole list of people with the surname Glass, and then all these different individuals. So again, you may be able to find additional members, just try to use different techniques while you're doing this. One of the most helpful records that we found for the Glass family was this death record for our second Wallace Glass. He died in 1933. His parents are identified as Wallace Glass, giving us a third generation for Wallace Glass, and the mothers of the children probably. We refer to these people as freedom's first generation, those who were born during slavery and who lived to see emancipation, and then they raised their children during Reconstruction. When guests get back this far, we encourage them to start researching local books and articles on slavery and the free black population so they get some idea of the local history of life in that region. And then with the 1880 census, we now see the whole family. So we see the third generation Wallace in green, Wallace Glass. He's 56, he was born around 1824. His wife is listed as Tilda, but we know her former name is Matilda. She's 45, born around 1835. And also on the spread, you can't see it here, we found out Wallace was from Virginia. So at some point, he was born during slavery. How did he get to Tennessee? Did he come to Tennessee as a free person of color? Or was he brought to Tennessee as an enslaved person? We don't know yet, but we find some information soon. And then this is the digital record of that scene. Um, 
version of that state where it's easier to read lawless. This at our 1870 census, where we find it, or if you can't find it, with the people who work with, we have accomplished our first major goal in African American genealogy. So, typical of most families, when we got to 1870, we didn't see any further censuses. And so we, I asked the Boston head, I said, do you have any oral history on your family? Do you know about the slave owners? any farms, estates, plantations, any places where your family might be, uh, might be from, and your answer was no. Usually when we're dealing with the public, most people tell us no. And so then my strategy is just a strategy or any strategy we can do. The strategy I use is to let's look for a slave owner in the county where they last were, in Waterdale County. Oh, I'm sorry. Oops, I'm sorry. With the last name Blacks, um, who would have come from the state of Virginia. Also keeping in mind, as we look at this 1870 census, six members of the family would have showed up in 1860 when the slave was kept. So we wanted to keep all of this in mind. When we looked at the slave schedules for 1860, okay, sorry. And so when we looked at the slave schedules for 1860 to 1850, we found one glass slave owner. And that was a P.T. Glass. And so this was the 1860 slave schedule. He's listed there second on the list. Um, and that G-L-A-S-S -S is the old English spelling, but it's a double S. And then all of the enslaved people in we explain to the public that 99% of slave schedules, of course, they list the slave owner, they list the inventory of the enslaved people, but usually most of those people are without names on that record. Um, there's a handful, though, of slave schedules, including Hampshire County, Virginia, that does capture the names of the enslaved people. So if you're from, there are only about five counties or so that actually listed the names of enslaved people. But if your family's from one of those counties, you have certainly hit the jack, the jackpot, so to speak. And we also talk about using wild cards. So when we were looking for PC Glass, it took us a while to actually find one. On the digital record, his name came up as G L O S and G L A P. And so I had to use wild cards. So, so what I did, I then put G L in an asterisk, and then in the county I put Lauderdale County. And so the database then listed all county slave holders with that last name. Uh, and then I was able to find them. And once we did that, we had to start the process all over again. And this was some of the information I found out about Blast. And so again, this was how he appeared on the digital record, PF Black GLAP. So it took a while in using the wild cards to finally uh, find him, but we did. And then the list of people he owned. And so we found that President Thornton Glass was born in Virginia as Wallace Glass, the patriarch of the Glass family, was born in Virginia. He was born in a place called Halifax County, and he had migrated to Wheatland, Tennessee with his parents. He became a lawyer, he served with the Confederate Army, he was a Tennessee state representative, and a member of the 49th and 50th U.S. Congress. So now, of course, we need to look for wills for that family. So by this time, this is about my third session with Alton and Hattie, and we literally were at the end of the session. It was the end of the day. We were on Zoom, so we can't be on Zoom forever. So I had to get out of Zoom. And I was like, oh my god, we're like, 
right here, I think this is the man, you know, so who, you know, and it just like kind of irked me. And so, um, so something popped in mind. I said, well, so why don't we just go back on the computer and Google slaves of Preston Fort and Last Mordor County, particularly since he was such an important person in terms of Tennessee history. And then when I did that, first I found a probate that was from a little that was from 1901 for him. He didn't die, he was born in 1824, that was 1901. I don't mind 1901, you know, that's just too late. Anything about slaves on. So then I uh, Google slaves of President Trump Black. But what did I know? I found um, this. It was a um, history blog called Black Ripley, a history about African Americans in the surrounding region. And in 2014, eight years earlier, someone by the name of Tiffany posted a story about President Trump Black who left $5 to his former enslaved man, Chris Glass, in his 1901 will. And I was like, oh my God, 1901, dear Lord. And so who was Prince Glass? Prince Glass was one of the twins of Wallace and Matilda Glass listed on that 1870 census. And so he had actually broken one brick wall for that family. He was awarded five dollars, which was a then, which is equivalent to about one hundred and seventy dollars today. Not much money, but it is what it is. And so this is the actual census. Um, I'm sorry, actual will, and it was an itemized will where he um, again was providing that money for him. When I look back on the cases where we have been able to break the 1870 brick wall, there were basically four factors that they all had in common. All five cases, and so far it's been five cases where we've been able to break the brick wall just in a public genealogy session, they all share the surname with the slave owner. The slave owner was a kind of what I call small slave owner, and the migration of these African American families was pretty much limited. They were within particular counties in that state. They had not done a lot of migration. And four of the counties were resolved with the will, and one was through a birth register. So that was how that happened. And then I just want to share this one other page. And of course, you know, there are all kinds of records that you can look for. We tell people. Doing genealogy research is like putting together a good term paper. You want to use as many sources as possible, and you want to go beyond, you know, the, the one database or two databases that you may be using. And so we share about using slave birth registers, freedom's bank records, freedom's bureau records, and the um, museum has a project. They will be releasing a portal on the freedom's bureau records shortly. So please stay tuned for that. And some other records include cohabitation records, and as you know, plantation ledgers, account books, wills, and deeds, and other property records. And with that, I will conclude my talk. Thank you so much.